let's get into it. We got the guide to running long distances. You know, it doesn't matter whether or not you're young, you're in your 30s, 40s, 20s, trying to run 5Ks, half marathons, marathons. Let's talk about long distance and how to get better at it. You know, I'm, I'm excited about this category. I mean, I've looked at this and I think a lot of people don't realize that they think people are runners. They are all around athletes, you have to really prepare for this. Well, there's a lot to it too because you get hurt so easily because of all the impact running down the roads. I mean, I, I've met so many people that have kind of got into this. Well, we'll start with the 5K. Oh, I really liked it. I liked it. I liked it a lot. Let's try the half marathon. And every single time it comes around, you've got this slightly out of shape person, gets a little motivated, wants to do the distance stuff, and then their knees hurt. Well, and you, then their back hurts. Yeah. And you know, you're thinking about 5K and all of a sudden you're 2K into it and. <laughs> All of a sudden, the pain starts to come in. Well, if, yeah, if you haven't run much and you don't actually have the muscles ready to go in some of these distance things, kneecaps, shins, a lot of problem areas. You know, we'll get into the, some of the injury prevention stuff a little bit later in those segments, but there's no doubt about it. There's a, a lot of impact during the entire distance running. We always do a lot of stuff with speed, so I thought it'd be uh, good to kind of dive into helping these distance runners out. First segment here, we're going to be talking a little bit about endurance training. And most of the time you can accomplish this, this by running a little bit longer distances. If you're starting out, you know, set a time period at which you want to run. If it's real early in your running career, let's just start at ground zero. Set your timer for 10 minutes and get out there at like a smaller perceived exertion, right? Maybe about 50% effort. You could still hold a conversation with somebody and you're going to begin the buildup process. That's generally where you want to start. If you're a little bit more advanced, you can obviously pick up the time periods a little bit and stretch your runs, but I wouldn't get anything over 15 minutes for your first week or so. And then every week after that, add on, you know, three to five minutes and mess with the time duration that you're going to run as well as a little bit faster runs and shorter durations, right? You can kind of almost segment them out. One day you're running a little bit longer distances, less perceived exertion. The next training sequence, you may be running a little bit shorter time with more perceived exertion. So it's not just, I'm going to go run for 15 minutes. I'm actually going to set a plan sort of as a warm up then pick up the pace, then slow it down. I a would bit. highly recommend it. I remember growing up, uh, I pitched. So one of the biggest things that you always had to do as a pitcher is if you threw, then you had to run these long campus runs and you always had to do these endurance style things to make your arm feel better, right? Move the lactic acid, a lot of blood flow. It helped the healing process an awful lot. But when we do this, I mean, you were a long distance runner. We were running so much after every time you threw, we threw every three to five days. So you would have run day, then you'd have a, a kind of a 50% run day, and then you'd be back in it trying to get your throwing. But running was a part of it every single day. And I can remember being very used to running these massive long distances. So then it'd be like, oh, you know, I'm going I'm to get out there and have a little run. You run for like 25 <laughs> minutes. You're used to running for 40, doing a campus runs like six or seven miles, right? So you get out there for like a 25 minute run. You think you're kind of okay. And then the next day your shin hurts, your knee hurts. Your body just falls apart when you aren't used to these things. So I would highly recommend just like weight training, put those types of principles towards your distance running and kind of segment the things a little bit. Start small, build up from week to week. I think too, if you would have maybe mixed it up to where you're, okay, we're going to do eight or 10 pulls. Now let's do three sprint pulls. Something that changed sure. it up a little bit different. And, and and just like you're saying, mixing it up a little bit, uh, a great tool is Farlick runs or interval runs are going to be a big part for that distance running. You can mix those type of workouts in. So say that you got a seven day and you're going to have four run days, right? A couple off days in there, some recovery sequences. And we'll give you some examples of some weight training and things you can do later in the show. But if you're going to be doing your distance runs, as we just kind of reviewed, add in a Farlick run where let's just kind of go over that. A Farlick run basically means uh, that you're going to be doing, it's an interval style, but less direction. Sort of a little bit more fun. You're going to pick a spot. You're going to, I'm going to go to the end of this road, or I'm going to go to that building over there and I'm going to go top speed. Then I'm going to slow it down a little bit. Absolutely. So rather than just doing your long drawn out endurance style pace, both of these training methods are going to be pushing the pace a little bit. So say, just as you said, you pick a building, you're going to take maybe 70% of exertion where you're kind of moving into zone two, zone three, you're pushing yourself a little bit. And you're getting quite fatigued and then you'll slow down and you'll stay in your running form, but you're going to move back down to that 30, 40%. And you can mix, mix with all these uh, types of perceived exertion, right? And what I mean by that is, what do you feel like? 
you know, if you're running your tail off and you can't talk to the person next to you or you couldn't answer the phone at that moment, then you're kind of pushing the pace a little bit. That's kind of where you want to be ending up in those types of methods, right? Those two training modalities are going to be used for improving your overall endurance capabilities. It's kind of a, a great tool to mix up, but it's also going to help with your ability to run farther, longer, faster. If you watch a, a longer run, a, a marathon, sometimes they almost look like they're on cruise control, but they didn't get there just by being on cruise control. No, it, the Olympics too are watching some of the Boston Marathon. It's kind of insane to watch the their capabilities. You know, when you when you see those types of people be able to accelerate and then just hold this crazy pace for well, an hour two it, hours it, it's sort of like interval training when you look at their stats and they go the first five miles was this the second five miles was that but it's all pretty close and they're trying to set a pace and then at some point then somebody's looking to break away and you got to be ready for that and know where that's going to happen to add a little bit more variety to some of these farlic workouts We've got a couple here that we can kind of review. You've got the free farlic, which is basically you're going to be going 10 to 25 harder sets within your running time period. So you can take those as if maybe you were going to do hards for 15 second, 30 second runs, and you can mix them up throughout those 15 to 25 sets. Um, but have a little bit of freedom with it. So anytime you come to the hill on the track, you're going to run up at heavy, come back down, jog 100 meters, do the same thing. A little bit of freedom there. Um, but you just overall want to stay within that 10 to 25 times of you know heavy, heavy running. Number two, you want to grab that one. The bridging sessions is going to be, go ahead. The bridging sessions are going to be a little bit more of an interval. We're going to go 30 seconds on where you're running hard, then you're going to back off for 90 seconds and then repeat that, you know, and, and do a specified number of times, 10 to 15 times, just getting yourself ready. And then you can see here, we've got the Mona Farlick. Now what that style is, is going to be a little bit more of your traditional. It looks like it's uh, the protocols about 42 minutes. You have a 10 minute warm up, and basically you're going to go 90 seconds on pretty heavy sprinting and then 90 seconds off with a consistently slower stride, but you want to stay consistent and don't stop running. You'll move through two sessions of that. Then you'll go 60 seconds on, 60 seconds off four times, 30 seconds on, 60 seconds off for four times, 15 seconds on, 15 seconds off for four times, and then you'll have a cool down. Let me tell you, that one will be, oh, that'll toast you a little <laughs> bit there. The next one's referred to as mixed paces. And what this one is, is for traditionally used for shorter distances, like your five or your 10K. Uh, it can also be used for cross country racing. But I find this one to be a little bit easier because pretty simple. You're not really going to stop on your brakes. Obviously, if you push yourself too hard, you may have to. But generally, you're going to be running for six minutes hard, all out, kind of taking yourself uh, with experience, you'll know how hard that means uh, for you. You know, obviously, you can't sprint for six minutes. So how hard can you really run for six minutes and still be able to hold your stride? That is kind of up to the uh, <laughs> the user, if you will. But you'll run hard for six minutes, then you'll run hard for five minutes, run hard for four minutes, three minutes, two minutes, down to one. So you'll see in each one of those sections of your faster runs, you're going to be running a little bit harder because when it comes down to one minute, that's going to be a little bit more of an all-out last leg of your race kind of sprinting to the finish line feel and each of those are about 90 seconds in between so not a lot of break um, but this is still a distance running speed you're not trying to kill yourself with an all-out sprint at six minutes it would be so near you're, impossible you're kind of thinking in terms of what would my pace be if i was running a full 5k or right 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 so it's almost um yeah six your your six minute pace is going to be pretty up there but yet when you're down to that last one minute set, eh, that's probably going to be all you got left in the tank. Yeah. And in between each of those, in those 90 seconds, I would highly recommend holding a jog. You don't want to take it all the way down to a walk. Hold a jog and get used to really expanding the lungs and trying to catch your breath as you're still moving. I think part of that would be in the, in the speed phase, you'd think in terms of what I would be running at a 5k. Then when you're when you're going to take the break, then maybe you're going to run at the pace you were going to run a full marathon. Sure, that, that would be a great way to look at it. 
So far licks in a nutshell basically are just giving you uh, a little bit of freedom, but in intervals, it's going to be more structured. And there's a couple examples that we found that uh, we'll kind of bring to your attention. One of them is called interval repeats. And what that'll do is you'll basically run 200 meters and repeat the recoveries of 100 meters. So you run 200, then you rest for 100, but all while still running, right? When we're doing this distance style running, we don't just want to stop and take a break as if we were doing sprints, you know, 40s, you'd run a 40, you'd walk back, light jog maybe, but you want to be the most ballistic possible. In this method, we still want to try to push the endurance envelope. So you're going to be jogging those 100 meters, and then you would sprint the 200. So you're setting this up as an actual plan versus the far lake is where you're going to just pick a spot. Exactly, exactly. Another type of interval that you can run is basically a pyramid. You can set your distances. If you're a beginner, you can do things like 200, 400, 800. If you're a little bit more advanced or you're going to be running longer distances, you can move it up to like an 800, 1200, or even a 1600 meter. And the rest durations in between are the light jogs. Just cut those in half, make it easy. So if your interval session is a 200 meter all out, then you'll rest or you'll jog for that 100 meter and so on and so forth. So if you get up to a 1600 meter all out run, then you'll rest for an 800 in a nice slow jog. So you're just gradually building your way Yeah, you up. build it up. And then after you get to your four or your five distances you've selected, then you'll walk it back down. So say you did a two, four, eight, and a 1600, then you'd run your 1600, 800, 400, just everything in reverse or 800, So how does the, the walking it back down come in how does that help uh i think it's just it's it's just a tool to mix it up you know if we want to do those longer distances imagine when you're running that really long distance you kind of almost go on an emotional roller coaster if you will if you're running really long distances in the middle of your run you kind of get that runner's high you're feeling good you're able to push yourself and then towards the end of it it's the grind time if you're running a full marathon your body's going to feel terrible towards the end even if you're in great perform break or great peak performance for your own body it doesn't really matter if you've pushed yourself you're going to feel the pain so towards that end range uh when you start moving back down to those shorter distances that's when you're going to start pushing the pace again so imagine your your 1600 meter pace in this interval style is going to be much different than your 200 meter pace right you're trying to move that perceived exertion up you're trying to really get into that higher zones when you're running. So if you're in that 1600 meter in the middle, you're going to be running a little bit slower and then it's going to train that back half of your runs where you're going to be picking up the pace after you're really, really tired. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I think that may be if I go out and I study the course a little bit, I kind of have an idea. I want to train based on hills, uphill, downhill. Yeah, that could be a big advantage for sure. Just depending on the terrain. So yeah, I see that. And then vice versa, you could do a ladder. And what a ladder will do is basically you take the pyramid out of it. You're going to move up 200, 400, 800, 1600, and then lose the back half. But the pyramid runs are definitely harder than the ladder because ideally after you've completely peaked at that 1600 in the pyramid runs, you're still going to have to find another gear while the ladders is a little bit more of, you know, you're going in one direction. You're taking it all the way to the hilt when you're at your most tired you'll then be done. So yeah, you're going to build up, build up, and then, okay, that's it. I made it. Yeah, the pyramid, if you're a newbie, mm. that ain't going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, you're only halfway done when you get to the top. <laughs> right, the exactly. Pyramid. Really, though, like both of those types of training methods for if you're really first into long distance running, start with the endurance portion, right? Just general running. And then after you get about two or three weeks under your belt and you get up around that 15, 20 minute mark, you can start playing with some of these intervals because you're not really going to have the capacity to do these intervals when you're at that really early stage. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, yeah. You're going to have to work your way into it. It's like anything else. Right. So once you can get about 20 minutes in, you can kind of start messing with these farlic runs in the middle or possibly even some of these build up intervals. But generally you kind of have to have a bit of a, a ground or a foundation put in place first. Well, you gotta have a plan. Every time you ever work with the distance runner, it seems like people begin to fall apart. So what I wanna do with this segment is kind of go through the muscle groups that you should be working, targeting, whether it be trying to keep them loose, or strengthen in the gym. We're gonna kind of dig into this a little bit. Some of the most important exercises that you could be doing is gonna be split lunges, Nordic curls, calf raises. Uh, there's an exercise called a wall drill that's great for developing your hip flexors. 
resistance bands, hills, and of course, a variety of different core training exercises. Let's kind of dig into each one a little bit. Um, the split lunges is going to be great for stretching out your hips, building hip flexors, and of course, really developing the flexibility in your hips to drive off your back leg. If you've ever seen uh, an image of a runner, they've always in a nice upright position if you're a distance runner, and you drive that back leg off the ground. But what a lot of people will find, and this is kind of the demographic of not elite distance runners, but more of you know some people at the gym that want to get into their first 5K, that want to get into the you know their first half marathon and things like that. Most all of them all have desk jobs. Most all of them sit all day long. Extremely tight hip flexors. And the position to run efficiently is an upright position where you drive off the back leg, pushing your foot forward. And if you ever see any elite level sprinters, they've got the flexibility to allow that to happen. And if you've ever worked with someone that sits at a desk all day, they have the tightest hip flexors known to man because all they ever do is sit. So uh, the split lunge is going to be one of the best exercises that you can do for your lower half to not only promote flexibility, but also build a lot of leg strength. Well, you have to have that leg strength and that sort of that knee drive. The hip flexors are essential. If you've ever watched people and they get towards the end of that run, that, that stride isn't as long as it was a few miles or or so back and you got to build up that strength. Right. So the, the hip flexors, or I guess the split lunge, there's a couple different variations that you'll be able to do. And uh, I would highly recommend doing walking or even in reverse. So a lot of people have knee issues. And whenever you have knee issues, a lot of times it's just from lack of mobility most of the time. Or they have some type of damage. But most of the time, if it's lack of mobility, the best way to start these split lunges is to do them in reverse. And you don't have to move anywhere at first, right? So the step one would be, can you drop, say, your right leg back, do a split lunge, sit next to a squat rack, utilize a resistance band looped over something high so you can use it for a little bit of balance. But if you're not that much of a beginner, a reverse lunge where you come up and you're standing in the exact same place, that's going to be a great place to start. If you're a little bit more advanced, do walking reverse lunges. It's going to be the less strenuous to your knee. But if you're feeling good and you want to start building some strength, forward lunges can also be utilized with dumbbells. That would and be kind of the hierarchy that I would You know use. that I'm a big proponent of doing things in reverse or doing it in back, doing it backwards. It, I mean, your mind gets in the game. Now we got to work on balance and strength and endurance. And I think overall, that's just another good way to prepare yourself. Yeah, absolutely. You, you want to mix it up a little bit, but uh, I can't stress it enough. If you got a bit of a funny knee, a reverse lunge just takes a lot of the pressure out of your leg. And, and one of the other benefits that you can do is you can kind of almost mess, mess with the angle at which your knee is over your toe. So in a reverse lunge, there's a lot of variables taken out of it. When you're moving forward, if you do a forward lunge, when you step and you shift all that weight, if you have any instability or a lack of strength, you can kind of shift too fast in your knee. You know, if you get that fast shift and you've got a, a wonky knee, you know about it's, it real quick. It's going to go one way or the other or too far forward. Right. Yeah. So, so what, with the reverse lunge, you get a little bit more in control back in the exercise. So if you are just doing static where you're just standing up and down, you take your right leg back, you stand back up, you take your right leg back, you stand back up, eight to 10 on each side, and then you can progress into the walking reverse lunge. But it gives you a lot more stability. It's just a, a good recommendation that I would give anybody that's not used to lunges, hasn't been doing them, start them in reverse, and then you can build up to moving forward with weights in your hands and different things. So what would be another good exercise? Another one is going to be your Nordic curls. Uh, we've talked about that a little bit in the episodes previous to now, uh, just breaking them down, how to do them specifically. So we won't get into it in too much depth, but basically it's a hamstring exercise that you can either use with resistance bands, manual resisted, or you can stick them in a Nordic curl machine. Um, but more or less, it's your body weight moving against your hamstrings. You'll go out nice and flat. You'll pull them up. You can do this on a stability ball on your back as well. If you're a beginner, lay on your back, put your heels on top of a stability ball, hands out to the side, nice and stable, bridge up so your body's in a straight line. Then you'll curl your heels to your butt. Got to work the hamstrings. Got to get them strong with length. Uh, just as we said, you know, all these people are sitting in chairs with their heels to their butts all day and their hip flexors locked up. So hamstrings have to get strong long. So the great thing about that specific exercise or the ball rolls is you can mix in those static areas at which you're under load in length, right? So when the 
the actual hamstrings all the way stretched and you're still under load, that's going to be what we really want. We want to get strength from end to end, not just always curled up like in a chair. Now this well, the, the lack of hamstring training, I think, is, is I've seen that hamstrings seem to be one of the highest uh, where you're – People are having injuries and, and slowdowns because they didn't train them enough. Yeah, we spent a lot of time trying to help sprinters run fast. And, uh, you know, it, it's kind of funny that it still takes place here in, in long distance running as well. It's just the body needs stronger hamstrings and the way that our world works. It's always mm-hmm. sitting, always having them balled up, not stretched, not strong. So spending some time on your hamstrings is going to be a, a good addition to any type of training. What about the calves? It seems to be another area that is not worked as much as it should be. Yeah, it's funny you say that. I, I can remember any time that I would do super long distance runs on pavements, I seem to always get shin splints. But what's funny about the shin splint is most of the time you always think it's a bit of an overworked area, impact injury. But what I found nearly eight, nine times out of 10 is I would develop these massive trigger points, these huge knots in my calves, and it would cause my, my shin splint. And then when I would spend some time rolling, utilizing, before I had any of this cool equipment that you could utilize on your calf, the roller sticks and things like that, I actually would use a golf club. I took a golf club and you wear your slick pants, you know, some of your gym style pants, and I'd use a golf club and grind out my calves. And you could break up all that tissue, and then lo and behold, no more shin splint. But generally, if you work your calves and strengthen your feet, you have a lot less shin issues. So I would highly recommend calf raises or even push pushing or dragging sleds forward. If any, any time you ever get behind a sled and you're pushing it, you can actually tell that the heavier the load gets, the more you feel it in your feet, which is kind of odd. You wouldn't expect that. You would think, oh man, back, core, glutes, legs, uh, you know what I mean? Push the sled, but uh, you feel it a ton in your feet if you have weak, if you have weak feet. Um, so that's going to be a really important exercise. Now, another way you can do that is throw resistance bands around your waist. If you have like a partner or a training partner and drag each other on a track or on a football field. So you'll give yourself a little bit of space, put one loop around your partner. You put the loop around your back. You've got basically a a loaded anchor, right? You're walking, allowing that tension to flow through your quads and your knees, building some strength that way while your partner is getting the forward side of it, strengthening their feet. It's a pretty decent little exercise that if you have a training partner, it can be a lot of fun to build strength in that way. And the best way to set that up would be in like 40 to 60 second uh, working sets. So you'll drag for 60 seconds, take a break, maybe 30, 40 seconds off, and then the partner will then do their set. uh, And you're going to have they have to remember that this is not a tug of war, that it is just to apply a, a, a moderate level of, of resistance so that you're continuing to move forward and not fighting and getting yeah. out of your route. Uh, yeah, you make a really good point. Whenever you're working with partners, you want to make sure that you don't make them freeze. Uh, if you give them too much resistance, a lot of times you'll see that people will get stuck. So right. imagine if you're dragging someone and you get that point at which you've got too much resistance, everything gets wonky, your knees slide out, your arms kind of get going a little crazy and you get stuck. You do not want that. So the resistance from the anchor is providing enough resistance to keep natural running form, natural movement. And as you move through, you'll get more fatigue. So you may have to apply a little less resistance or more or cut down the time periods a little bit. But the number one rule is you do not want to break down the movement, right? You don't want to get froze at any point in time. The good part about that partner situation is that once you're on the other side, now you feel it so that when you go back as the anchor, you'll be able to know, okay, I, I, I understand better what I need to do for them. Hopefully they'll do it for me. Absolutely. Yeah, the, the anchor is going to be the one that's providing the resistance and you'll feel it as soon as you turn around. That it, Once you get stuck, it, it kind of takes you out of your rhythm and then you got to rebuild back into the muscle groups at which you're trying to target. So you really don't want to get stuck. So pay attention while you're anchoring. If you notice um, a little hesitation out of the partner in the front, and, and you'll feel the difference when they're actually anchoring you. You'll understand. <laughs> you'll understand you got to give and oh, take yeah. a little bit. And if you're going to do the sled pull, then you got to realize there is a point where there's too much weight and it's really counterproductive. Right, right. And, it, and one of the biggest exercises for all of speed training is to focus on hip flexors. So we always recommend doing the wall drill when it comes to running. And if you're going to be doing longer distances, you can still do some ballistic style movements 
to build those muscles. Stronger hip flexors is going to give you a better stride for longer durations. So what a wall drill is, is you'll approach the side of a building. You'll use a gym wall. You can even use bleachers. You just want to be able to lower your body down into about a 45 degree angle. And when you hold that position, you'll load one foot and drive the other knee up. And you can almost run in place or you can use an exchange style method where you'll go one, two, three, and then you'll hold one, two, three, and then you'll hold. And of course, strap on K-bands and you can amplify that resistance. They're pretty amazing because you can run in them, sprint in them. I would not recommend running long, long, long distances in K-bands. The more fatigued you get, the more it's going to mess with your running form. But to develop your hip flexors and that drive off your back leg, the wall drill with K-bands, you really can't beat that exercise for those specific muscle groups. I love that drill. I was going to say I've had a couple of my athletes tell me they're just going to start calling me Coach Hip Flexor because I said it so many times. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's the game have it to changer. Run, man. Yeah. That position in which you reach forward with your front foot and you drive off the back foot, you just can't get a better exercise than the wall drill. You're taking the upper body out of it power off the ground also going to be working your feet in that specific exercise at that angle and it really teaches posture through the core anytime you see long distance runners that have a little bit of weakness or they're very fatigued they always get very you know the hangy they're starting to drag up top and a lot of times that's inexperienced runners as well but when you're doing the wall drill to hold that angle at a 45 degree angle and get your foot back down to where it's supposed to be, it takes a really tight core and to work through that resistance. So the wall drill is by far one of the best hip flexor exercises that you're going to want to do. You've got lunges, also going to stretch the hip flexors, build strength in the glutes. You've got the Nordic curls that are going to target a lot of your hamstrings uh, and, and that whole chain on the back half. Then you've got your calf raises or your sled, your sled drags, and then the wall drill is going to be excellent for truly focusing on your hip flexors. Now, when you do the wall drill, say for long distance runners, are you still doing that similar to your sprinters? 15 seconds, 20 seconds break? Uh, yeah, so I would always keep the wall drill a little bit more towards the ballistic side of things. Now, don't get me wrong. If you want to stretch the sets past 15 seconds, that's fine. But I wouldn't really take it anything over 20, 25 seconds because the follow-up exercise that we've got here is the resistance bands on the hills. So I would do the wall drill as a bit of a ballistic style movement. You'll stay around that 15, 20 seconds of active resistance, take you about a 90 second break, do about four to six sets of that, then head over to the hill, pick a distance that's doable, right? It depends on You're the back level. to the hill. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> no, but uh, pick a distance that's doable. You don't want to find the biggest hill you've ever seen and make sure you've got to get to the top. If you find the biggest hill possible, that's fine. That's at most tracks, most football fields. But go to that hill and set up distances that you can achieve good running form. So whether it be 30 yards, whether it be 20 yards, push it a little bit, but you don't want to deteriorate that idea of the high knee. When you're running with the resistance bands, it's easy to get lazy with your front knee. So don't stretch the distances to a distance at which you'll lose your running form. If you can get all the way up a 40 yard hill, hey, more power to you. But if you're in the 20s, don't feel bad. You're going to be building strength with the resistance bands and then just keep your good form. You think it's okay to use the bleachers if you don't have a hill. Sure, that's a that's a good point. Yeah, you could absolutely do bleachers as well. Just make sure you get your knees up and you still want to drive. One of the biggest differences with a stair is it doesn't make you you're not going to sprint quite as seamlessly as you would on right. a hill. Does that make sense? You depending on the distance they are between one another, some of them it, it requires a little bit of a different stride. Is it still going to be effective? Sure, but uh, if you're looking at building some strength for long distance running, a hill is a great way to challenge your cardiovascular abilities as well as working your hip flexors. It doesn't have to be a like you said. It doesn't have to be a long hill. Even if you can get ten to twenty, thirty yards, that's still a good a good distance for you. Absolutely, absolutely. So one of the last uh, exercises or, or things to target is going to be your core. And you know we preach that a lot in the sprint training that we do. But even for long distance runners, I can't tell you the number of people that I've worked with that have bad backs all because their hamstrings and glutes get too tight and their core really is just not very strong. So anytime that you're doing long distance running with all that impact, the stronger your core is, the more effective you're going to run and the less pain you're going to have. So spend some time two or three times a week 
moving through some core exercises. And I would suggest a couple of them that would be very easy to do. You can get on YouTube, of course, and you can search a variety of different core exercises. But some of the best ones are going to be ones that are your the weight of your body is hanging or you're in a bridge position. Crunches and things like that are okay if you're very, very out of shape. You know, it's a good place to start. But generally speaking, if you can hold your body up on a dip bar, if you can hold your body up on a pull-up bar, lifting your legs, you're going to be working a magnitude of different muscle groups than just simply laying on the on your back and doing a little crunch. I, mean, I think you're not trying to build a six-pack here. You're trying to build strength throughout your entire core. If you've ever gotten to that point when you're running and all of a sudden you're moving a little bit side to side, your core is letting you down. You don't quite have the endurance to 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 keep going and stay inside that hip line. Yeah, and you know, most of my long distance running experiences has been just massive conditioning for baseball. And when we would do campus runs and things like that, I I've, I've had those experiences, been slightly dehydrated, you know, you kind of tweaked your back or you know, pitching's a super ballistic movement. Go ahead and throw 9 innings one day and then go on a 7.2 mile run the <laughs> next day. What what goes first? Your back. Your back is so exhausted from the day before. That if you know you did something uh, that maybe you shouldn't have done and drank too many beverages or things <laughs> of that nature and didn't quite get hydrated enough, you know it seems like the next day you're feeling all those aches and pains. You didn't get enough sleep. You didn't recover enough. And the weakest link is always what's going to go. Your body will find that weak link. Right. So you know strengthen the core. To give you just uh, two examples of something that I'm very into right now is uh, elbows on a stability ball. I love those type of exercises. Roll your hips underneath you. If you don't know what that means, I've made tons of videos talking about this concept, but more or less you're rolling your hips under almost like a slight hump motion. Just a pelvic tilt down is going to turn on your abs. And then you can do different elbow variations, whether it be circles, chops, those types of movements, or even spin the concept around, be in a push-up position with your hands on the ground, and put your feet on a stability ball. Once again, get that little pelvic tilt in, do knees in, knees in a circle, those types of motions going to be far more effective than any type of crunching you're going to do because you're also having to stabilize with the lower back and all that kind of stuff well, as well. The stability ball offers so many variables, and if you're a beginner, just sit on it. Yeah, you're gonna, yeah, you're gonna you're have a, to engage your core. Just if you're to a do super that. beginner, not not a bad place to start. Uh, or you can always pick it up and do rotational style exercises, reach over the top. That's a pretty decent beginner move. Um, but a lot of different exercises where you're actually holding the load of your body, utilizing your spine, trying to strengthen that area, whether it be side bridges, sitting on a dip bar, lifting your knees turning them from side to side at a 45 degree angle, all those exercises are going to be far more beneficial for your back and your core for running these long distances than just doing crunches. You know, a good, a good area where I teach myself or I teach athletes is be conscious of when you get to that point, when you start to get exhausted and you start to get a little sloppy, then you start to realize, man, yeah, that I've got to build that core. Then you can start realizing if you went back to that stability ball, this is where I'm going to make my gains. Next segment here is going to be a little bit about running form. You know, if you're first time into running long distances, it's kind of important that you spend a little bit of time <laughs> trying to figure out how to conserve energy. You know, if you are only used to sprinting in high school and you've kind of moved on to this distance running thing, or if you're uh, an athlete that's always done ballistic movements, you kind of move a little bit different. You know, I've met a lot of people that come out and they're running distances on the balls of their feet. They look like a sprinter and they're always ending up with lots of injuries. There's too much impact. They can't run as far. And most of it just has to do with the running form. Well, yeah, you know, you got to keep that body in control. Start using your arms, make your, sure that your stride's not too long or too short. Um, and then you're going to find, you, you'll get that groove once you get after yeah, it. If you but. work from like the top down. So thinking about the upper body, you want a little bit more of an erect position than probably most people would think of your sprinting position, right? You want to be a little bit more erect. Your arms need to be way more relaxed than what most of the time I see. You got fists balled up. You've got some tension in people's necks when they get to get grinding. They're really trying to push themselves. 
The more you can be relaxed, you should see your face move in every stride. Your face should be relaxed. Your hands should be relaxed. Not getting too awful wild with them from side to side. Another great tip is to make sure, check out your feet. Most of these injuries always occur because people will strike the ground too far in front of them on their heel. Anytime you're doing that, it's going to slow you down, but it's also going to lead to a whole lot of injuries in your lower leg, whether it be you know, you get the first result in your knee, or do you start getting shin splints first? Your foot strike and having good shoes is going to be a big part of your success running long distances for any amount of time. I think you, when, when you strike your foot, you want to make sure that you're standing tall, your body's underneath you, you're pushing off. Otherwise, you know, you're almost, seems to me, you're decelerating. If you're leaning too far forward or, you know, your, your stride's too long. Well, you don't want to land on the ball of your foot most of the time, you know, some people can land a little bit farther forward if they're genetically inclined to do so. But most of the time, some of your elite level distance runners are landing about midfoot, not quite on their heel, not quite on the ball of their feet, right? You know, a middle strike. And then as they stride back, they keep a really nice upright position and drive their foot back. And I see that in, in a lot of runners where that seems to be the issue. And a lot of it comes from hip mobility. If your hip flexors are too tight, you just can't seem to hold your stride and drive your foot off the ground far enough back to really utilize your glutes and your hammies to propel you forward. So making sure your hip flexors are nice and loose. But I would tell you the biggest tip that you will ever hear for running long distances is you better go find some good shoes. <laughs> you better. I was going to say shoes. And I'm, I'm a shoe kind of a shoe freak. Yeah. You got to have good shoes. I don't know what it is about it, but if you get a little bit of a lower limb issue when you go get a new pair of running shoes and actually ones that are fitted towards you, you can't spend better money. No. And I don't, I don't let them last too long. I, they may, you know, I'm, I know what it feels like, and I can get to that point where I say, okay, time for some new shoes. It's kind of weird, isn't it? Because I've had many times where you'll be exercising, you'll, you'll do your what, whatever workout you're into at the time, and all of a sudden you get a little knee something, your foot kind of hurts a little bit, you get a new pair of shoes, all of it goes away. It's kind of insane to see how most everything's just related to your foot. Well, if you've ever trained somebody and they start talking about back aches or certain things i just yeah let's check out there. let's look at these shoes you real quick get rid of those bad boys <laughs> so uh, how Sorry. many how many miles you put on those shoes <laughs> let's uh <laughs> let's talk about this here i think uh you might need to upgrade uh, you know, to something newer than the 1984 pegasus you're wearing <laughs> you're, you're worth more than that uh, i worked with this one guy one time and he came and he wanted to run his first 5k and he came in converse high tops you know what i'm talking about i do well i was Back when that first started, I buddy. mean to tell you though, like, what are you thinking? Like a Converse? I get your minimalist approach, but <laughs> I'm pretty sure your foot's gonna break. I mean, he's out of shape. He's kind of a big guy. I'm like, you're gonna need some arch support, my friend. <laughs> I think those things are made to look cool, not to run in. Well, you need running shoes. Yeah, we ought to do a podcast soon on uh, that. Would be a good topic. Let's let's do some research on those minimalist shoes and some feet stuff. That'd be kind of interesting to go down that road. I've I've seen them run around. I've seen different, you know clicks of groups of people that work out that kind of run down that route but i've just never had very great success working out without shoes on i don't no, I like gotta the feel, feel good of it. yeah i, I gotta feel good yeah i don't like the feel of it but you know i don't know we'll, we'll get into you know some more running stuff in the next segment pain 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 that's where we're at we got to talk through some of these knee issues. We got to talk through shin splints, tight hammies, hip flexor issues, and even the IT bands. Whenever you're doing this distance running stuff, I've worked with many, 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 many clients that all start getting on the band. I tell you, it happens every single time. You get to working out a little bit, drop a couple LBs every single time. I think I'm going to try a 5K. You got oh, any right recommendations? Away. I'm going to jump right into that. Anyways, I'm going to think I'm going to well, try a 5K. You got any recommendations? Okay, they run their 5K. That was easy. Yeah, it's because it's a 5K. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know you just ran a mile in 27 well, minutes. <laughs> well, that's what I mean. They all, Well, you know, finish it in X amount of time, and you, it just brings me back to the days where we were trying to break five-minute miles and things like that for conditioning. And, you know, five minutes, I ain't a sprinter, you know what I mean, per se in those days, you know. But, these, uh, these big time marathon people are running 26 of those under that time frame. Oh so, yeah, I mean, I think the fastest mile I ever ran was maybe like a 440 or something like that, and I was cooking, and I felt terrible when I was done. But nonetheless, 
all these guys come in and they, they kind of like get in through it. They want to do the 5K, then they're doing a half marathon. And then the crazy, crazy ones really enjoyed that, made it through, and they want to try a marathon out. But you're always going to run into each one of these issues every single time. It's either going to, you're going to get a runner's knee, you're going to have some, some kind of a shin splint, you're going to have some kind of a foot issue, and most of the time the IT band becomes a factor. So we're going to kind of work through each one of these uh, briefly and give you some tips on things you can do. The first one, we'll talk about the runner's knee. Runner's knee means your knee hurts. <laughs> Pretty simple. And why does it hurt? <laughs> Pretty simple. Well, a knee hurts a lot of times from your running form, but the impact in general is going to wear you down. And if you don't keep things flexible and make sure that you're running perfectly, that's when you run into a lot of these problems. Most often, the thing that I see the most is bad shoes. Bad shoes mean bad knees. Sometimes it has a lot to do with running form, but a lot of times it's just from bad knees and you got an IT band issue. So that specific symptom, if you go to the IT band and you put a ballistic band around your foot, you're laying on your back, loop it around. You can use a beach towel or even like a belt. Wrap it around your foot. Keep your hips square to the floor. Don't let them roll up as if when you lay one foot over the side, right? So imagine you're laying on your back like a pencil, hands off to the side. You've got a resistance band or a towel now wrapped around your foot and you pull your foot off the ground. So you've got one leg up. If you slide that across your body, if you keep your hips down, your foot will probably be about a foot from your other foot. So you'll be just down at a 45 degree angle. And if that lights you up down your side, you start there. You got mm -hmm. an IT band yes. issue, right? And then you'll kind of walk up. But what your body's going to want to do is when you bring it up a little bit higher, your hips are going to come off the ground. You have to resist that. You do not want your hips to come up off the ground and roll towards that side because then it just turns to a low back glute stretch. We don't want that. Keep your hips nice and square to the floor, glue them to the ground, and you'll find out that that leg barely even moves anywhere. And if you've got a big IT band issue, that is one of the best exercises or stretches that you should be doing regularly to get rid of that. Well, this is one of the, the segment where we want to catch you at the beginning so that we don't have to do that afterwards when you come back and say, oh my God, it hurts right through here. Yeah, some people, you know, they do yoga every single week. You know, you, you do weightlifting every single week. You're, you're, if you're a runner, you're doing your runs every single week. Well, something everybody should be doing in the entire world every single week is kind of going through the checklist of things that hurt. And if you start doing rehabilitation style exercises frequently, you can eliminate an awful lot of these problems. Job's constantly. Should take about five, six minutes a day. Five pound weights, nice three second decelerations. Keep your shoulders feeling pretty darn good if you've got any knots, issues, impingement. Can kind of keep you rolling. Same thing for your knees. Do you stretch your glutes, your IT bands, make sure your hamstrings are rolling okay? Do you do any type of hip flexor stretches to make sure your quads are loose? Doesn't take very long, right? You don't have to sit in there and go to hot yoga and sit in a crazy pose and be sweaty in a dark room. You don't have to do all that. But most of these types of exercises, you can do on the regular and, and you can be in a much better situation. When you're walking up and down steps, do you stop halfway up, hang off one of them for 30 seconds, stretch out your calves? It can go a long ways for keeping your feet healthy. You know, and you're going to be a much happier runner over time. Remember, running is sort of the fun part. We got to get ready. We got to prepare our body to do that. And uh, you know, injuries just suck. They're not much fun. And as you get a little bit older, what every single one of them takes. There's two parts that I've learned as I get older. Every time you get hurt, it takes five times as long to heal, and then you get to deal with that indefinitely <laughs> i mean really though it just you should it, hang out with my friends a little bit it's yeah. like a oh my god we need to all go to the rehab center you know what i mean though it's like anytime you get hurt now it's like you, you pulled your hamstring real bad i remember two or three years ago now it, don't you get that thing talking to you every now and again it's like it, as soon as it starts to tweak i stop isn't it crazy and though? then i you know sort of stretch it out make sure that maybe i didn't get a little bit too tight but yeah, when you're going through that and you really pull that hamstring, that's a couple months. Yeah, but my neck thing last year, I had the funky neck that, you know, jacked it up pretty good, had whiplash several times. And I think to this day, if I do jumping jacks, I can feel my neck being unstable. Still, to this day, my neck fatigues faster than everything else. Let's just like your hamstring, right? So if you've got some serious injury, it just takes a really long time to say that it's gone. 
you know. I guess it's a good learning experience because I tell you what, I'm going to make sure it never happens again. Well, it might even be stronger than the other one. It seems like yeah, as much as you have to rehab and you're training it and making sure it's stretched and making sure it's strong, it, it, sometimes it almost feels as though your injured muscle becomes uh, almost your, your strongest baby. point. Yeah. It's your baby. But then that's why you want to make sure that you're doing equal equal number of reps right. on both sides. So let, let's give you some recommendations. So runner's knee. I want to give you two recommendations, maybe three. Depends where we end up with this. Um, but I would say by far, one of the best things you can do if you've got a funky knee is you got to get flexibility back in it. It's probably caused by your IT band or it's caused by way too tight a quad. So you're going to do two things. If you got a funky knee, grab a golf club or a roller stick. It needs to be hard. Get on some slick pants or even some sliders, sit in there by yourself. Cause you're going to look like a, you know, you're going to look like a weirdo in the corner <laughs> rubbing on your quad with this thing, but you straighten out your leg and you're going to grind up and down that thing until you find a knot. And I promise you, if your knee hurts, there is one. It's probably a little bit towards the outside of your quad and you're going to go up and down until you find it or it may be on your internal side of your quad. Somewhere in there, you got a boulder, guaranteed. When you find that puppy, sit on it for 20, 30 seconds, grinding it back and forth. The first time you do this, you're going to be so miserable that you're going to wish you never did it. But you're going to do it every other day until it goes away. And I can promise you, within about a week, that thing's really going to lengthen out, and you're going to start losing those boulders. But the sooner you get rid of the boulders in your quad, the faster your knee's going to feel a lot better. Now, after you do that, you're going to do those IT band stretches that I've been talking about so that you can get a little bit more mobility back in it. And I'm not talking about some chronic knee pain or you blew your ACL out. I'm talking about your knee kind of is a little achy because you're trying to run a 5K. So if you got some serious injury, go to the doctor. I'm not telling you to skip a doctor because your knee's bothering you. But if you got some nagging pain that you can see obviously is from running too much, this is going to be the protocol. It's going to get you squared away. Next exercise you're going to do is use that ballistic band and wrap it around your foot again, laying on the ground. What you'll do is it's going to you're going to feel like, you know, a scorpion stretch from a cheerleader where they hold their foot out back like a crazy person. It's basically what you're going to do. You'll roll over onto your side and you're going to grab that band up behind your head and pull your quad up. But what you'll feel is if your hip flexor is extremely tight, it is going to be like a lightning rod through your body. So start pretty slow. But as your hip flexor loosens up, as you're doing this every other day, what you're going to do is you're going to let your heel sink all the way to your butt. And what you'll find is there's so much pressure in your knee joint from all that tension right around your kneecap that if you do this for like two or three weeks, your knee's going to start loosening up. And that's not going to feel like such a kneecap stretch as much as like a ah, quad. Okay. Okay. Does that make <laughs> well, sense? Make sure that you're, you're keeping that, those hips on the ground, you know. So that well, now, on this one, we're going to be on our side. Okay. This on one, we'd side. be laying on your side. So yeah. imagine if I wrap it around my left foot, Okay. So I've done my hamstring stretch, something along those lines. Now I'm going to roll onto my right hip. Okay, so okay. I lay on the ground, laying on my right hip. I take those bands and I put them behind my head. Okay, and now I've got my foot set up to where if I pull it all, it's going to be stretching my hip flexor like crazy. After your hip flexor gets a little loose, what you can do is you can pull your heel all the way to your butt as much as you can and then roll it back just a smidge and you'll feel that once your knee starts loosening up it's a really good quad stretch but it only loosens up or your quad only gets that good stretch when your knee loosens up a little bit and your hip flexor loosens up a little bit you may not even feel it until a week or two in it kind of takes a little while to loosen some of that stuff up because your pain is coming from a lot of tightnesses another stretch so this will be three Another stretch is a lot easier to do. That one you're going to feel like, you know, a bit of a, a crazy yoga person, but <laughs> it is a great stretch. I do it all the time, pretty much every single day. Another stretch that you should be doing is find a bench or a couch. Um, a, a couch is probably best because you'll already be on a soft surface, but you want to put some pillows or a cushion of some kind, a yoga mat underneath your kneecap. But don't get focused on the kneecap because we're going to move past the kneecap. So we're going to do a right leg stretch. So imagine you're going to put your foot on top of the couch, okay? You're mm -hmm. going to bring your knee as close to the edge of the recliner, edge of the couch as you can. Slide it all the way. 
you'll be bent over a little bit because that load is going to be very heavy on the hip flexor if you're sitting upright, okay? So imagine you're kind of leaning forward almost in a push-up position. You slide that knee back towards the couch. You let the foot hang up over the top of the couch. And then your left leg will be as if you're in a lunge position. So to take all the pressure out of that stretch, you're going to lay forward. So you'll be leaned forward either on your elbows or on your hands. And as you're leaned forward, it's really next to no stretch. As you sit up, you're going to feel it through your hips. And it, probably the first time you've ever done it, you may not even be able to sit up in an upright posture. Don't take that as a, oh, stop here. Never do this again. Take that as, holy moly, I have no range of motion in my hips, right? And what you'll find that your hip flexor is a big contributor to your quad tightness, which ties to your knee. Same thing as your IT band. Your IT band, if it gets lit up, your knee bothers you. It's all the insertions, all those muscles turn to tendons, tendons turn to inflammation, all that stuff kind of jacking with your knee. So this is going to work on the top side. You're going to be working your hip flexor, and as your hip flexor loosens up, your quad's going to loosen up dramatically in this stretch. So if you start with a, a couch, you slide the knee in, you have the foot over the top, you have your body down low, no stretch engaged, right? You're in a lunge position, so that left knee's kind of right by your arms. Start sitting up, and the higher you can sit up into good posture, the end game is big chest, sit up tall, sink forward in your hips. When you can do that position, it's going to change the whole way your legs operate. When I say use a squat bench, is going to be the couch is going to restrict the amount that your knee can move back, right? Mm -hmm. That back knee is going to hit the couch. If you use a, a squat bench or a squat bench, what am I talking about? A bench like in a weight room or something that has nothing underneath it. The nice thing about it is you can actually pull that knee completely underneath the object to which your heel or your foot is on. Does that make sense? And you can kind of almost get more of a stretch. Does that make and is that kind of clear with my yeah, description? It, it, it's amazing how all these other areas of your body, when you when you say, oh, my knee hurts, well, there, there could be a multitude of reasons why. And we need to start working the other areas to strengthen and stretch them to take the stress off your knee. Well, you can have, uh, there's a video, if you get on YouTube, look up like, um, I think it was called, type in K-bands training, top maintenance workout. I made it uh, two or three months ago. There's a, some of these exercises are in there, but it's kind of like a, a nice packaged video that'll give you a string of exercises you should be doing frequently. But if you're a runner and you're not doing some frequent three-day-a-week rehabilitation-style stretches, meet slight weight training, you know, you're going to get hurt. And yeah. the only way you prevent any of that is to kind of get in front of all That's of it. That's preventive maintenance. Right. So so that type of stretch you can do on both legs. And I promise you the first time you ever do it, you'll feel like, no, I, th this isn't in my wheelhouse. Because I can, you can't, <laughs> can't sit up it. at all. Right. But if you, you can progress to it, right? So you lay forward if that's stretching you. And then the more you can sit upright, you'll find way more range of motion come. And as soon as you get all your range of motion back, your knee's going to feel a ton better. The second exercise that we're going to look at is shin splints. And yeah, there's tons of information out there. So I'm just going to give you the thing that has always worked for me. And you can try it too if you've got shin splints. And we kind of mentioned a little bit earlier, grab that golf club, grab a roller stick. Foam rollers are not going to work near as well because there's just not enough weight that you can apply on the foam roller. I think, um, I think everybody should have a stick roller in their bag. Yeah, and what those things do are a golf club, baseball bat's kind of a little too big. Uh, you can even get a rolling pin, similar concept. But if you hang it off, uh, sit on the edge of a bench or something, you're going to grind your calf the same way you're doing with your quad. And if you have a shin splint, I promise you, you have a knot in your, quad, in your calf. Just the same way if your knee hurt, you got something in your quad. So make sure that you target your calves and then hang off of steps for almost – extreme amounts of time 45 seconds minute and a half two minutes whatever you can stand you got to stretch those calves out the faster your calves get full range of motion back i promise you i've never had a shin splint not go away if you find the trigger points in your calf and you start stretching your calves religiously and not to mention the same old same old bad knees bad feet or let's say bad knees shin splints Buy new shoes, start rehab. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with that. No, yeah, but and then we, you know, we already halfway home. Yeah, if you got a bad shin, you got a bad knee, start with the shoes. Get shoes like yesterday, and mm. uh, then then you move into the rehabilitation exercises. We we'll keep coming back to those shoes. It's important.
it's important. The next one is going to be tight hamstrings. Uh, majority of the time, people aren't really going to have like a terrible tear or something along those lines running distances. But you just want to make sure the indications for your hamstrings, if you start getting tight backs when you're running, if you feel any uncomfortable stuff up top in your core, nine times out of ten, it's because your hamstrings and your glutes are way too tight. Simple glute stretch. Take a band, a belt, something along those lines. We've been talking a lot about wrapping something around your foot. It's one of the easiest ways to stretch your lower limbs. So you'll lay on your back, bring up one foot in a nice bend, and then you're going to take that other foot and kind of almost catty corner, turn it towards you, right? So you're going to stretch that foot towards your chest. And again, you can look these things up on YouTube and see a real good example, but that's a great stretch. And another one I would highly recommend is most people shower. So oh, that's going to be a little weird here, but <laughs> um, I find that if you stretch your hamstrings on an edge of something, it's one of the best ways to stretch your hamstrings because you can take everything out of the equation. Most people in their showers have some kind of a ledge. So if you have a ledge that's tall enough, something at a bench height, and you set your foot on up, close the chain a little bit, pull your toes up. And if you've got your foot nice and straight, no, no, no bend in the knee, you're nice and straight, set it right out in front of you and then create a really big chest, stand up really tall and then try to put your belly button on your quad. So what I mean by that is we're not shrugging the shoulders down. You're not cheating with your back flexibility. It's literally just your hamstring. So you got your foot up, don't straighten your toes, pull your toes up. Am I coming up just straight tall? I'm not, I don't want to go back, right? Yeah, you're just nice, erect. Just nice and straight, tall. Yeah, really good posture. Sit up nice and tall, and then you're going to want to think about your belly button. Mm -hmm. Keep it tall, keep it good, and then now put your belly button on your thigh. And you'll feel that you won't even move, and your hamstring will go, <gasps> oh, God. <laughs> But what you'll do is do that in the shower because it's just you probably take a shower every single day. You should be doing this stretch every single day if your back's bothering you. But what it does is it takes out your lower back and your upper back flexibility completely. You can get away with a toe grab if, if you know, you kind of really well, reach with the forward. upper body. Yeah. If you have that really good posture and you pull your toe up, I promise you'll be surprised at how unflexible your hamstrings are. But a really easy stretch to just tie into your everyday routine. You're in the shower. You're doing this type of a hamstring stretch. Hopefully no one can see through the glass because you're going to look a little <laughs> weird. But just get in there and get it done because uh, hamstrings are going to be a big part of not only the knees, but just, you know, kind of keeping your, your overall your back and your hammies healthy when you're doing all this distance running. So the final segment here, the last piece of the puzzle, you know, we said we're going to give you a complete guide. We've kind of walked through some of these segments, uh, a little bit of weight training advice, some distances, some interval, farlic runs. You got to talk about hydration in your diet a little bit. The One of the biggest things that I always have come across when training people that get into the 5Ks, half marathon, these first stages of trying to do these things is they all think they need to eat like way more food. Your appetite increases. You're running longer distances. You're sweating a ton. You get dehydrated. You want to drink more water. Your, your, your body's kind of going through a lot when you're running these really long distances. And I find that most people aren't getting hydrated enough and they think that they need to eat way more food than they are. And let's be honest, if you want to run faster, weighing 25 pounds less if you're overweight is going to make you run faster than probably anything <laughs> yeah. else. I mean, really. Yeah, and, and drink that water. I don't think that you need to overeat to try to store up energy. Yeah, don't forget that drinking water too fast oftentimes is not hydrating you near as much as you think. Uh, and I, I've been notorious for this, and it didn't even come on my radar until like a year ago. I used to just slam water. I would drink it really fast because I knew I needed a lot of water. I would feel thirsty. So I would just drink mass amounts of water in like these short windows. And it wasn't until I started reading a, a whole bunch about weight cutting for MMA fighters and wrestlers and things and their tactics on how they go about cutting weight is by overloading water. And then more or less you, your body just pees it all out because you get in this window of water, 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 nothing. And uh, it kind of dawned on me. I'm like, that's kind of how I drink water. You know, I'd wake up in the morning, I'd slam a cup, I'd slam a cup. And when I mean slam a cup, it's probably like 12 ounces. I just drink the whole thing at once. I don't I, really I, take... I, I always think of Tom Hanks when he finally learned in the movie just to drink a little bit at a time. Yeah, yeah. Always have your water bottle with you. Yeah, I never really, yeah, I'd never really put much thought to it. But if, you know, just from my experiences, if you, if you are a chug water kind of person... 
it kind of actually defeats the whole purpose in the sense of if you're trying to get really hydrated before an event, it kind of takes days to actually achieve. If you think you're just going to drink some water the morning of the event and then feel stupendous, you know, if you've got tightness during your training sessions, if you feel a little overtrained, fatigued, a lot of times this can be tied to hydration. So start trying to drink water more frequently throughout the day. Don't think that a small window of smashing a bunch of water before your race is actually going to hydrate your body much at all. Well, it's not just going to immediately go through your entire body. It's going to take some time. Maybe you should have started an hour ago Well, you it, know, before it, you run. Yeah, it, the, the window before your training, you know, spread out how much you're drinking, you know, make sure you're getting plenty hydrated before the event, of course, but most of your hydration for that amount of time is going to happen days before, you know, if you're running on E on hydration two, three days before your race and think that just slamming some water before is going to put your muscles in the right spot. That's not going to get it done. So you want to spend a little bit of time reading some about your hydration, you know, check your pee, right? If you're peeing yellow all the time, you're dehydrated. Electrolytes are going to help you hold water. Uh, make sure that you're getting all those types of things. Uh, I think that most newbies that are starting to get into distance stuff kind of don't really understand the idea of getting back after they kill themselves. And, you know, after you really are driving into the ground and training hard for a half marathon on your first one, you feel so terrible, probably more so because you're dehydrated if you've been doing any type of training before. You know, you're, you're ready for the race, you know, but that day's going to beat you up. Oh, it is. And, well, we're doing all this talk about prep, prep, prep. Now we need to make sure we do some recovery during these workouts. Well, and during the weeks too, if you're doing longer runs or you're working on any of those interval days, and I'll tell you the amount of sweat that you have on an interval style day meets just a long distance run it's night and day. And what I mean by that is if you go on, say a 40 minute run and you're at half speed, you could talk to someone the entire time. Well, you get sweat and sure, depending on the temperature. Absolutely. You know, it's not like you're not going to sweat, but generally if you don't do anything to really exert yourself, your body becomes pretty darn efficient. So your first run at 40 minutes. Yeah. You're going to be sweating like a dog. Two months into that, that 40 minute run, if you got a nice breeze and it's 75 outside, you may not even sweat at all. But when you go out and run an interval, I promise you, no matter what time of year it is, if you're pushing yourself the way you're supposed to be pushing yourself, you're going to be sweating tons. So remember when you're doing these type of training regimens, mixing up your workouts, if you're feeling tremendously sore, hydration probably should be your number one priority outside of some of these stretches. Are you drinking enough water to get rid of a lot of the soreness? It's a whole package, putting everything together, and that's what we're hoping we can accomplish. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think this wraps it up. We've got our complete series here for the long-distance runner. If you have any other specific style questions, head to kbandstraining.com or type some comments on the YouTube video. We'll be sure to get back to you there, but uh, we hope this kind of brought together all the elements that can get you started if you're trying to get into long distance running and stick around for uh, the next couple episodes. We've got some really good topics coming up.